Welcome. This is the end time revival. Glory be to the name of the Lord. Today we are presenting you with the testimony of Emmanuel Eni, a man that was delivered from the power of darkness. He shares his testimony on how the Lord delivered him and how he was used by the enemy to fight the church of God and to bring down many churches and different strategies they were using in the kingdom of darkness to fight the children of God. This is a testimony that was compiled in his book called Delivered from the Powers of Darkness. I read chapter 1, My Escape to New Life. Train up a child in a way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22 verse 6 This is a story of God's works, mighty, wonderful, and mysterious. In obedience to the command of Jesus Christ to me, saying, Go and testify what I have done for you. One usually thinks of misfortune as an act of fate, and that we can do nothing to alter the events of our lives. To an extent, this is true. In the case of a child of God, his life is planned. Proverbs 16 verse 9 And whether that plan is fulfilled or not depends on a number of factors. The individual's closeness to God, his view about the ultimate purpose of life, and the socio-spiritual environment he finds himself. The course of your life is challenged by some external factors. The, cr the crisis is reached when you give over your will one way or the other, for good or evil. You can love or hate. You can wish to understand or misunderstand. The will to obey is the greatest force of a newborn Christian while the will to disobey is the most destroying force of the sinner. A child, when left alone in the world, is controlled by one of two powers, good or bad, right or wrong, God or the devil. Everyone is challenged by these two forces of life, and each must choose which life he must live. And I believe that this is what the Bible says. Train up a child in a way he should go, and when he grows, he will not depart from it. You will agree that the dearest and closest person to any child's heart is his mother, and often is an unfortunate child and more exposed to attacks of the devil than children with parents. A mother is a protector of body and soul, but it becomes double strategy when both parents are lost and more so in most mysterious circumstances. My story started 20 years ago in a little village called Amare Arugobu Uzo item in Bendi Local Government Authority in Imo State. My parents were not classified among the rich, but my dad was privileged to in inherit 42 hectares of land from my grandfather, a blessing which has today brought the greatest misfortune over recorded in the history of the family. My dad was greatly envied by his distant and near relations for reasons I do not know, perhaps for his vast land inheritance. We were a happy family, my parents having got four of us, love, Margaret, Emmanuel, and Chiniere. After having the first two daughters, my parents waited for 14 years before having me, the only son, and later my younger sister, Chiniere. This brought real happiness to the family, but this happiness was short-lived as the first strategy struck. My lovely and caring mother died. She was alleged to have died owing to witchcraft, and four years later my father died, again through an alleged work of juju involved against him. Two years later, after the death of, those, of both parents, my eldest sister, Love, disappeared mysteriously, and Margaret, the second daughter of my parents, went mental. 
It was a chain of tragedies in the life of a humble and otherwise happy family. My younger sister, Chinyere, and I were sent to our grandparents. There I completed my elementary education and was later admitted into an item high school. I read up to class 3 and dropped out of school as a result of lack of fund for fees and etc etc shortly after that my grandparents also died after all the ceremonies that go with the burials an unknown relation col collected my younger sister Chinier, and up to this late date i do not know her whereabouts i was forced by some severe maltreatment to go back to my father's house and there to live alone at the age of 13 years how does a child of 13 years feed himself in the midst of his father's enemies and consequently his own enemies how afraid i was this event seemed to have brought me to the end of worthwhile living was there anyone who cared was there anyone who was concerned about a little boy's misfortune one day i met a friend I knew during my elementary school days named Chinedum Unagwe. Chinedum loved me very much and having had all that befell me, took me to his to his parents who readily received me and took me as a second son. Life came back to normal again. I was well cared for. I was happy again. Then I knew that the God my mother prayed to when she was alive was alive somewhere hence he had provided provided me with new parents so i thought in my mind i enjoyed this goodness for about two years and then the devil struck again chinadum and his parents were traveling to umahai and their car ran into a deeper carrying laterists Chinedum and his parents died on the spot. On hearing the news, I collapsed. My sorrow could better be imagined. I imagined to survive through the burial ceremony, supplying those cooking with firewood and running errands, at the end of which I went back to my father's house and resumed the menial jobs to be able to feed. I continued doing odd jobs on the farm in gardens going a fishing with elders until one day a man from my compound hired me to work in his farm for fifty thousand at the farm he subjected me to a series of questions first he asked me to show him my father's lands secondly to hand over such lands to a man no matter how closely related he was in either case, I objected and he was offended. He then vowed to kill me in the forest. I became afraid and ran and shouted for help. Unfortunately, because the area was far in, into the thick forest, no one came, but help came from God. He pursued me with his knife, but being younger, I was too fast for him and fell into a pit of about 1.82 meters deep and was covered by the grass in it. He searched for me and after a while he gave up. I later struggled out of the pit and through another road returned to the village. I reported the incident to the elders in the compound but no action was taken. The common plight of orphans. This incident created real hatred in my young heart. No one loved me. No one cared. I reflected in my mind why anyone would want to kill me, knowing I had no parents. Life was full of misery. Now I know that God in his love restrained the devil from suggesting suicide to me. I turned to the church and became a full member of the Assemblies of God church in my village. I still am. But unfortunately, no one cared even when some of the members knew about me. 
It is important to know that I became a full member of the church without knowing Jesus Christ. I never knew what it meant to be born again. If you are in the church of Jesus Christ and find yourself in the situation I found myself, give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says, let him have all your worries and cares, for he is always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. That is 1 Peter 5 verse 7. In the midst of all this hardship and suffering, Alice appeared. Alice was a girl I knew during my elementary school days. She was five years older and from the same village. We were in the same class, sat on the same bench and became very friendly. With this childhood love affair, we promised getting married when we would be old. Ridiculous. A child of 11 years then, without parents, no education, no food to eat, promising marriage to a girl of five years, his senior. Alice later left for Ukere for her secondary education and sent me dozens of love letters. The next time I met Alice, I was 15 years and she was 20. She had finished her secondary school education and was working with the Standard Bank Lagos, now First Bank, where her parents lived. Alice, having known my background and my plight, took advantage of it. She told me to join her at Lagos and handed me her house address with 50 naira. That was a fortune for a young boy of 15 years who had never earned up to 2 naira a day. This was manna from heaven and this meant that Lagos must be a wonderful place with plenty of money, the good things of life for all to enjoy. Then I must go to Lagos to make my own money and get riches too. Going to Lagos to my mind was my only way of escape. Escape from my father's enemies. Escape from my enemies. Escape from hunger and all my problems. Escape. Escape. Yes, escape from all that is evil. Chapter 2. Initiation. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That is Proverbs 14, verse 12. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mere and dead. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. That is Isaiah 57, verse 20 to 21. And life outside Jesus Christ is exactly as stated in the above scripture. I left my village and armed with 50 naira and the address given to me by Alice, escaping to freedom, liberty, enjoyment, and all that go with them. But as you will see later, it was my far from what I had conceived in my young heart. When I arrived in Lagos, it was so beautiful in my eyes, and I compared with compared it with heaven, whatever heaven is like. I saw all those tall and beautiful buildings, and on each face I could see happiness, so I thought. People appeared very busy, each one minding her or his business. I was excited and said to myself, now I know I am free. I arrived at Ikontol Road, Victoria Island, and was well received by Alice and her parents. The parents knew me and my, my background as we came from the same village, but never knew of my relationship with their daughter. Alice then introduced me to them as a man she has chosen to marry. The parents were shocked, but after some discussions with her, agreed on the condition that they would further my education. Alice rejected their offer and requested that I be allowed to live with her in her own flat. The parents could not accept this, but insist she insisted. They had a strong argument for Four days and under some unexplained influence they agreed and I moved in with Alice. 
Alice, a very beautiful girl, told me that she is an accountant with the Standard Bank and that she would make me rich and give me all that I needed in this life and said, just settle down and enjoy yourself. My first impression about Lagos was true after all. Few months ago, I was in a small hut in a small village surrounded by hatred, starvation and suffering. And here I am, living in a big city in a well-furnished flat with a beautiful wife who had promised to give me all that life could offer. She showed me with gifts, money, clothing, love, and etc., etc. I never knew that the world was filled with those good things. The devil indeed is a deceiver. The scripture rightly says, The thief cometh not to not, but to for to steal, to kill, to destroy. Only the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, can give life and give it more abundantly. That's John 10, verse 10. Dear reader, the devil has no free gift. Whatever he gives you is for an exchange with your soul. This state of euphoria was short-lived because after a period of three months, strange things started happening. The mysterious experience. One night I woke up in the dead of the night and found a bow constrictor beside me. I wanted to shout but could not. Some nights I would wake up to see a large body as transparent as a cell phone bag. Some nights she would disappear and reappear. Some night I would hear strange noises or dancing in the living room, etc., etc. I could no longer bear these fearful happenings, so I decided to ask her, and the first reaction was violence and serious warning. She said, do not ask me this question again or else I will deal with you. From then I knew my life was in danger. I then preferred the sufferings in the village to what I came to discover. I became afraid of her. Two days passed and she came with smiles, gifts and hugged me. She told me how much she loved me and cared for me and encouraged me not to be afraid and promised to explain things to me later. She took me to a nightclub and there remained me of her promise to make me rich, etc., etc. And told me, one day you will know all that I know. We came back and life continued as normal between us. Inwardly, I knew I was in danger, but how could I escape? Where would I escape to? It is important to note here that Ellie's parents did not know that their daughter, though young, was involved in serious occultism and spiritualism, and she seriously warned me never to tell them if ever I loved my life. Dear reader, can you imagine a 20-year-old girl doing all these things? The outside world saw her as a very beautiful and harmless girl working with a big bank, but she was the devil's agent. There are a lot of Alice's in the world today, as you will find out later in this book. Horrific Discovery one day after she had left for work i decided to search the flat as a young and as she was the flat was well furnished she had four refrigerators and an opening one i saw human skulls different parts of human body both fresh and dry inside the ceiling were skeletons in another corner of one of the rooms i saw what I later knew as a chamber, a water pot filled with blood and a small tree in the center of the, of the pot, a calabash and a red cloth by it. I could not continue. Now I knew that I was a dead man and since I had nowhere to run to, I surrendered my life to whatever comes, life or death, kept and kept sealed lips. Alice came back from work and from the way she looked at me, I knew that right in her office, she knew what I did in the house. Encounter with the occult world. 
The following day, she requested me to follow her to a meeting. I was already a captive and had no choice. We went to a very big building on the outskirts of Lagos. On arriving, the building had an out underground conference hall. I was instructed by Alice to enter backwards. I obeyed and entered with my bag. She also did the same. The wall was so large with about 500 young men and women seated in a circle. And seated above them was a man whose head could only be seen and without a body as the leader. Some of these young people were students, undergraduates, graduates, teachers, and etc. etc. Alice pressed a button on the wall and a seat came out from the ground and I said, She did the same and another came out for her and she said, She introduced me to the congregation as a new member and they applauded and welcomed me. Alice was promoted as a result of this. All that they discussed in the meeting I never understood. At the end of it, as we were about to leave, I was asked to come back alone the following day by the leader. This was my first encounter with the occult world. The same night at about 2 a.m., and this is the usual hour of meetings and dangerous operations by all the forces of darkness and their agents, Alice woke me up and revealed certain things to me. She said, I am not an ordinary human being. I am half human and half spirit, but mainly of the spirit. What you see in my chamber is what I use during my prayers every morning, so that the spirits will guide me through the day. As for the skeletons, I will tell you later. I never said a word. She brought out some books on world mysteries for me to read, and with my inquisitive mind, I decided to read them. Shortly I became interested, and immediately she saw that I was now interested. Unknown to me, she sent my name to an occult society in India, as previously instructed. The following day I went back to the society alone, and they met nine others and some witnesses. We were to be initiated. We were called out to the center of the wall, and the following things were admitted administered to us a concussion that looked like putty was rubbed on our bodies this qualifies you as a full member a glass shot of oil like liquid was given to us to drink this qualifies you to be an agent a gun powder like substance was rubbed on our heads this qualifies you to study their mysteries Unknown also to me, this initiation ceremony was being recorded in India, and the next day I received a letter from them. In the letter, I was instructed to stain the letter with my own blood and to post it back to them through a means they described, not the post office. I did. From this point, there was no turning back. Turning back meant death, as one was always reminded, and I knew there was no more hope for me. Covenant with Alice Early one morning, she told me there was an important ceremony to be performed in the house. At 2 a.m., she brought a crawling child, a girl, alive before my eyes. Alice used her fingers and plucked out the child's eyes. The cry of that child broke my heart. She then slaughtered the child into pieces and poured both the blood and the flesh into a tray and asked me to eat. I refused. She looked straight at me and what came out of her eyes cannot be explained in writing. Before I knew what was happening, I was not only chewing the meat, but also licking the blood. While this was happening, she said, This is a covenant between us. You will never say out anything you see me do or anything about me to any human on earth. The day you break this covenant, your own is gone. Meaning that the day I break this covenant, I will be killed. 
After this incident, I started having strange feelings inside me. I was changed and could no longer control myself. A, wo a word of warning to mothers. Do you know your house helps? What is he, what is her or his background like? Do you care to find out all about him or her before entrusting the lives of your children to him or her? How did Alice get the little child she slaughtered, you may ask? Therefore, parents, know the background of your house helps. When Ellie saw that she had succeeded in getting me fully involved in spiritualism and was fast growing in it, she was satisfied and, then, and knew her mission was accomplished. She found a flat for me, helped me furnish it and thereafter severed the relationship. Covenant in India the society in Delhi, India, sent me a second letter asking me to come over to India. In it also, I was instructed to do the following. Eat, etc., etc. Eat decaying smelling reds and to have sexual intercourse with spirits in the cemetery at night. After fulfilling the above, I was bound never to have any sexual intercourse with any woman on earth. I sent a reply to their letter informing them that I had no visa, neither do I know how to get to India. At this time, I had started doing business. I was a serious smuggler, but because of these powers behind me, I had no trouble with customs, or etc. Et I started having a lot of money. Food and materials were no longer scarce. One day, I locked my flat and went out. Coming back, I opened the door, and behold, a man sitting in the parlor. I was afraid. He said, Are you not Emmanuel Amos? I said, I am. He said, I, I have been sent to come and collect you to India, so get ready. I looked everywhere and went and sat beside him on the, on the cushion, ready for the next order. But like lightning, he touched me and we vanished. The next place I found myself was in a big conference hall in Delhi, India, with a large congregation already seated and waiting to welcome us. They brought out files where my name had already been written and asked me to sign beside it. I did. A tray containing human flesh cut in pieces with a basin of blood were brought. An empty jug was given to each person. Then a man without head went round pouring the blood and flesh into the jugs. Different candles and incenses were being burnt also. The headless man made some incantations, and everyone drank the blood and ate the meat, and the meeting was over. Now, the period of my testing had come. I was sent to a valley about 200 meters deep. In it were assorted dangerous scepters and wild beasts. This were to torture me. I was not to shout, for if I did, I have failed the exam and the consequences was death. After seven days of agony, I was brought out and sent to a place called India Jungle. In this jungle, I saw different types of demonic baits, dem demonic because some had faces like dogs, some like cats, and etc. etc. Yet the wings inside this jungle was a cave, and this cave is only opened by these demonic baits. They opened the cave, and I went inside. The things I saw are hard to explain. They were terrible creatures. Some looked like human beings, but with tails and without human faces. This was another place of torture. The torture there could best be described as semi-hell. I was in that state for seven days and was brought out. I was then sent to a very big library that contained large volumes of mystic books to study. I later picked two books. Abyssinia, which means destruction, and Asina, which means giving life or curing. Later, I was given more books. 
I was instructed to build a chamber as soon as I returned to Nigeria with the following things in it. A native water pot filled with human blood, a living tree inside a human skull, vulture feathers, wild animal skins, bow skin and a big shiny latrice besides the spot, the, the pot. The blood inside the water pot is to be taken every morning with an incantation. I was also instructed never to eat any food cooked by humans, but that I would be fed supernaturally. With all these instructions, I, I came back to Nigeria the same way I went and fulfilled all back home in Nigeria. I had now became a part and a puzzle of the spirit world and could travel at will to any part of the world. According to the books I brought, spirit beings are living in space. Perhaps they would increase my powers, so I decided to try. I came out of my, my house and made some incantations and called the wheel wind and disappeared. I found myself in space and saw these spirit beings. What do you want? they asked. I told them I wanted powers. I came back to earth after two weeks having acquired powers from them. Like I said earlier, I no longer could control myself. Despite all these powers I had already received, I still needed more and more powers. I then decided to go into the underworld to prove that what was written in the books given to me. One day I went to a hidden place in the bush, made some incantations as stated in the books, and commanded the ground to open. The ground opened and the demons created, created steps immediately. I stepped in and went right inside the ground. There was total darkness that can only be compared with one of the plagues that occurred in Egypt as recorded in the Bible. I saw a lot of things that are hard to explain. I saw people chained, people who used for making money. Their duties are to work day and night to supply money to their captors. I saw some elite society members who came in to do some sacrifices and would go back to, to the world with some gifts given to them by the spirits controlling the place. I saw some church leaders who came for powers. Powers to say a thing that is accepted without questioning in the church. I stayed for two weeks and came back after receiving some powers. People saw me as a young and innocent, but I never knew I was dangerous. There are lots of such people around. Only those in Jesus Christ are safe in real sense of safety. Covenant with the Queen of the Coast One evening I decided to have a walk along a book at a Meta bus stop. I saw a young, beautiful lady standing. I never spoke a word to her. The next day, while passing also, I saw her still at the same spot. The third day, I saw her still at the same spot, and while passing, she called me. I stopped and introduced myself to her as Emmanuel Amos, but she refused introducing herself. I asked her name and address, but she only laughed. She asked me mine and I told her the street only. When I was about leaving, she said she would visit me one day. In my mind, I said that was impossible. I did not give her my house number. How then could she come? But true to her ways, I heard a knock on my door after a week of that meeting at the bus stop. There she was, the mysterious lady. I welcomed her in my mind. I wondered who this beautiful lady was, and did she knew she did, did she know she was trending on dangerous grounds? I entertained her, and she she left. After this first visit, she visit sh, sh, her visits became regular, without any relationships. I noticed that in her visits. She kept to a particular time and would not come a minute earlier or later. In some of her visits, I would take her to Lagos Bar Beach or to the Paramount Hotel or Ambassador Hotel, etc. etc. All this while, she still did not tell me her name. 
I decided not to worry since I knew the relationship would not develop more than that. I had already been instructed never to touch a woman. Suddenly, she changed the day visits to nights. During one of the visits, she told me, now it is time for you to visit me. We stayed together that night at 8 a.m. The following day, we took off. We joined the bus and she told, told the driver to stop at the barbage. As we stopped, I asked her, where are we going? She said, don't worry, you are going to know my house. She took me to a corner of the barbage and used something like a belt and tied around us. And immediately a force came from behind and pushed us into the sea. We started flying on the surface of the water and straight to the ocean. Dear reader, this happened in my physical form. At a point we sank into the sea bed and to my surprise I saw us walking along an expressway. We moved into a city with a lot of people, all very busy. The spirit world. I saw laboratories like science lab, designing lab, and a theater. At the back of the city, I saw young beautiful girls, handsome young men, no old people. She introduced me to them and I was welcomed. She took me to places like dark room, drying room, and parking room. She then took me to a main factory and warehouse and then came to a private mansion. There she sat me and told me, I am the queen of the coast and would like very much to work with you. I promise to give you wealth and all that go with it, protection and all that go with it, life and an angel to guide you. She pressed a button and a tray came out with human flesh in pieces. In it, we, we ate together. She commanded a bow to appear and asked me to swallow it. I could not. She insisted, but I could not. How could I swallow a live bow? She then used her powers and I swallowed it. These were three covenants, the human flesh and blood, the bow and the demonic angel which was always there to make sure no secret was revealed. But the angel was given power to discipline me if I went astray, and also to bring me food from the sea any time I was here on earth. I promised to obey her always. After this promise, she took me to another part of the ocean, this time an island. There were trees, and each of these trees had different duties tree for poisoning, tree for killing, tree for invoking, and tree for cure. She gave me powers to change to all kinds of sea animals like hippopotamus, a bow constrictor, and a crocodile, and then she vanished. I stayed in the sea for about a week and threw one of the mints as crocodile mentioned above. I came back to the world. The underworld laboratories, I stayed in Lagos for a week and went back to the sea. This time for two months, I went into the scientific laboratories to see what was happening. I saw psychiatrists, scientists, all working very seriously. The work of these scientists is to design beautiful things like flashy cars, etc., etc., latest weapons and to know the mastery of this world. If it were possible to know the pillar of the world, they could have. But thank God, only God knows. I moved into the designing room and there I saw many samples of cloth, perfumes and assorted types of cosmetic. And all these things, according to Lucifer, are to distract men's attention from the Almighty God. I also saw different th designs of electronics, computers, and alarms. There was also a TV from where they knew those who are born again Christian in the world. There you see and differentiate those who are churchgoers and those who are real Christians. I then moved from laboratories to the dark room 
and trying room. The dark room is where they kill any disobedient member. They kill by first draining the person's blood and then send the person to the machine room where she or he will be ground to, to powder. And then she send the dust to the sack room where they will be begged and kept for native doctors to collect for their charms. There were more things which are hard to explain in writing. Despite all these powers in me, I was not yet qualified to meet with Lucifer, but only qualified to be his agent. All the same, I was satisfied that I now had powers and could face and challenge and destroy things at will. Could there be any other powers anywhere I mused within my mind? Chapter 3. The Wicked Reign the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they may have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Thus, John chapter 10, verse 10. On returning to Lagos, I continued in my business, and after two weeks I went back to the sea. The queen of the coast gave me what she called her first assignment. I should go to the, my village and kill my uncle a prominent, powerful native doctor who was responsible, according to him, for the death of my parents. I obeyed and went, but having not killed before, I hadn't the courage to kill him. Rather, I destroyed his medicines and rendered him powerless. As a result of this act, he lost all his customers till this date. I came back to give a report assignment, but she was wrathful with me. She said the consequences of disobeying her instructions was death, but because of her love for me, she would send me back to the same village to kill two elders who, she said, gave a helping hand in the killing of my parents. Whether this was a punishment for disobeying her or not, I did not know. However, I obeyed and went back to the village and managed to kill this man, send their blood to him. As a result of these mysterious circumstances of their death, the elders in the village went to inquire, to inquire from another powerful native doctor who normally sent lightning to investigate the killer. Unfortunately, for this man, I met the native doctor in spirit where he was consulting with spirits and warned him not to say anything if he loved his life. He came out and told the elders to go home and beg one of their sons whom they had offended and never mentioned my name. The lightning he sent returned and struck in their midst, killing some and leaving many wounded. After this first act, the powers in me started manifesting themselves. I would deform a girl for refusing me friendship, and etc. etc. My meeting with Satan. I, learned, I later went back to Lagos. One day, a girl named Nina came to me. Nina, whose parents were from Anambara State, was a very beautiful young girl, but lives mostly in the sea. The underworld water spirit world. She was an Ardent agent of the queen of the coast and very wicked, she hated the Christians to the core and would go all length to fight Christianity. I first met her during my first visit to the sea. Nina came for an errand from the queen of the coast. We left immediately and reaching there, I learned of our having a conference with Lucifer. Satan. In this meeting, gave us the following instructions to fight the believers and not the unbelievers, because the unbelievers were already his. When he said this, one of us asked, Why? He said the reason was that God drove him out of that place. He refused to call the weight heaven, and all throughout our meetings with him, he never mentioned the weight heaven. Rather, he would always use the word that place because of pride. And therefore, he does not want any Christian to get there, heaven. He also told us that we should not fight the hypocrites. They are like me. 
he said. He continued his speech and said, We should only fight the real Christians, that his time was near. Therefore, we should fight as never before and make sure no one enters that place. So one of us said to him, We heard that God has sent someone to rescue mankind back to God. Satan then asked, Who is that? One member answered, Jesus! And to our greatest surprise, Lucifer fell from his seat. He shouted at the man and warned him never to mention that name in any of our meetings if he loved his life. It is true that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow. That is Philippians 2 verse 10, according to uh, Satan. At this incident, he encouraged us and told us not to mind these Christians that he, Lucifer, would soon come to rule the world and would give us his agent a better place so that we would not suffer with the rest of the world and he would make us rulers. He continued that since man likes fleshy and fanciful things, he would continue to manufacture these things and make sure that man has no time for his God and that he would use the following to destroy the church. money wealth, women. At the end of, he, of this speech, he dismissed the meeting. This was my first meeting with Lucifer. Several others followed after this meeting. As we were leaving, the Queen of the Coast, who now appears in different forms, invited me to a mansion. She ins inserted human ashes with other things inside the bones of my two legs, a stone, not an, ordi not an ordinary stone, in my finger, and something else inside the bone of my right hand. Each of these things had their duties. The stone in my finger was to know the thought of anyone against me. The one in my right hand was to empower me to destroy and the ones in my legs are to make me more hardened and to become more dangerous and also to enable me to change to a woman, beast, bed, cat, and etc. etc. She took me to one of the laboratories and gave me a telescope, a TV, and a video. These were not ordinary things but were to be used in detecting the bone again Christians and the church goers inside the church. Finally, she gave me 16 girls to work as my agents. Nina was one of them. I came back to Lagos armed with the above mentioned gifts. Transformed into Satan's agent, I had no human feelings, no mercy in my heart any longer. I went into operation immediately and destroyed five duplex at a go. They all sank inside the ground with their inhabitants. This happened at Logos in August 1982. The contractor was held responsible for not laying a good foundation and paid dearly for it. A lot of destruction happening in the world today are not man-made. This devil's duty is to steal kill destroy i say it again satan has no free gift i went into causing accident on the road etc etc a case i would like to mention is about a young convert who went about testifying of his salvation and deliverance he was causing a lot of harm in the spirit world for doing this so i planned an incident for him one day he was on a luxurious bus to Lagos. He had an appointment where he was to give his testimony. As the bus was on high speed, I wheeled it out of the road and went and crashed onto a tree. All the passengers died except this young convert. His escape was miraculous because he came out of the vehicle through the boot of the bus and shouted, I am safe! I am safe. We tried to stop him from testifying, but we failed. 
through the TV, we would know a man who repented newly and would pursue him seriously to see if we could make him backslide. If after six months we do not succeed, we would go into his business and make it bankrupt. If he or she is a civil servant, we would oppress him or her through the boss, and if possible make the boss terminate his or her appointment. If after all this he, he refuses to backslide, then we would give him up. But if he backslides, he would be killed to make sure he does not have a second chance to repent. I destroyed lives to the extent that Lucifer became very pleased and made me a chairman of the wizards. A month after my chairmanship, a meeting was called. We attended that meeting as baits, cats and snakes. These creatures are used for the following reasons. Turning to baits make wizards more dangerous. Turning to cats make wizards able to reach both spirits and humans. Turning to reds, an able wizard to enter into a house easily, then in the night turn to shadow, then to human being, and suck the victim's blood. In this meeting, we had only one item of, on the agenda, the Christians. We then scheduled to hold an African wizard conference in Benin City in 1983. We published it, published it in all dailies and all the public media. All the forces of darkness were mobilized and we were very confident that nothing was going to interrupt this meeting. In fact, everything was well planned and there was no loop, loophole. Suddenly, the Christians in Nigeria went into prayers and praises unto their God, and all our plans were shattered. Not only that, but our plans were shattered, but also there was a real confusion in the kingdom of darkness. As a result, the Witches and Wizards Conference could not be held in Nigeria. Christians should note that the moment they go into a real praise to God Almighty, they would be trouble and confusion both in the sea and in the air, and the agents of Satan would have no resting place. Prayer is like throwing a time bomb in our midst, and everyone will escape for his and her life. If Christians would realize and use the power and authority God has given them, they would control the affairs of their nation. Only Christians can save their own their save our nation after the failure of this conference which was later held in south africa i was called back to the sea when i arrived i was told from the moment i would make the sea my home and only visit the world for difficult operations i was given a new assignment inventing charms for native doctors in charge of the control room and sending the gifts opening of the garment churches, prayer houses, opening of maternities, opening stores and making them prosper, giving children and money. This will be explained one after the other. Opening of white garment churches. When a man comes to us for an assistant to build a prayer house and help him performing healings, etc., etc., we would be given some conditions. He will agree to donate to us one or two souls every year. At a certain level of, of office in the church, the person would be initiated to our society. No member would be allowed to come into the prayer house with shoes on. When he accepts these conditions, we would be given something like white gravel, human bones, blood and chumps, all in a native pot. We would be instructed to bury this pot with all its content in front of the church and bury the cross on its top. After the burial, only the cross would be seen. We would be advised to build a pool or keep a basin where spirits would continue to supply special water. This water is what you hear them call holy water. Many people when disturbed by evil spirits go to these prophets to cast them out. The truth is, they only add more demons to them. A devil cannot cast out devil. 
what the prophet would do is he will pray for the member and then give him her, him or him a red cloth to put in his or he, his house and then would advise him or her to always pray with candles and incense by this act the person invites us into his or her house sometimes the member would be advised to bring a goat or etc etc for sacrifice these sacrifices are for us to come and help cure the man the prophet has no power to cure or heal opening of maternities if a woman comes to us for assistance in opening a maternity and making it prosper she would be given this condition a month would be chosen by us in which all the children born in the maternity will die but the other month the children will leave if she accepts she would also be given a charm which we would attract people into the maternity there are such maternities in Oniche, Lagos etc etc shoes are not allowed into such maternities opening of fancy stores when a man approaches us for assistance in this respect he would be given a ring with a condition that no woman would be allowed to touch it he also must agree to be our member if he accepts to fulfill these conditions his store would be stocked always with the best and latest material by us giving of children if a barren woman goes to some native doctors after laying her complaint she would be given to bring the following a goat a native chuck and a baby came she would be advised to go and in her absence the native doctor will come to us bringing these things we would then mix certain things which are difficult to explain in writing include human ashes he would use this charm to cook food for the woman etc etc she would become pregnant and give birth but is not a normal human being if the child is a female she would leave and even get married but would remain barren all the time if the child is a male he will leave and even be trained only to die suddenly they never leave to bury their parents I would like to mention here that barrenness is mostly caused by demons. You may see a woman barren here on earth, but she would have children in the sea. I therefore advise God's children to wait on God alone because only God gives real children. Giving of money. If a man comes to us for money, he would be given these conditions to fulfill. He would be asked to give a part of his body or if he has a family he would be asked to bring his son if single he would be asked to bring his elder or younger brother whoever decides to bring must be from the same womb something worth mentioning is during the killing of the victim the person who brought him would be given a spear or an arrow his relations would be made to file past in a mirror as soon as the one he had donates passes he would be asked to strike and as this happens the victim would die where he is there are other methods but one thing satan does is this he makes sure that in the different methods the donor becomes responsible for the death of the victim by making the donor strike the victim remember satan has no free gift chapter 4 how satan fight christians we wrestle not against flesh and blood but wrest against principalities against powers against spiritual wickedness in high places that's ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 to 12. fighting christians after the command by lucifer to fight the christians we then set and mapped out ways of fighting them as always follows Causing sickness, causing barrenness, causing slumber in the church, causing confusion in the church, causing lukewarm in the church, making them ignorant of the word of God. By fission and emulation. 
fighting them physically amongst the above I would like to explain to you. fighting physically with the TV given to me I would see the born again Christians we do not fight hypocrites because they belong to us already we would then send our girls first to the big churches inside the church they would be chewing gum or make a child cry or do anything that would distract the people from hearing the word of God. They may decide to come spiritually and cause the people to sleep while the preaching is going on. The moment they see you have a sober reflection because of the preaching, they would wait on you outside the church. As soon as you come out, one of them would greet you and even present you a gift. It's not always what you love and would appear very friendly she would do everything and before you knew what was happening you had you had forgotten all your land in the church but for a real christian one of these girls after the service would jump out to greet you and would desire to know your house with the pretext that she was new in town and did not know many christians around on taking her her home she would quickly buy bananas and the christian would take this as a gesture of love she would continue her visits until she finally puts off the light of christ in you and then stops coming major operations in the living churches and fellowships are discouraging the christians from reading and studying the word of god and thereby making them ignorant of the authority and of the promises of god in crusade grounds, these girls would be sent to cause disagreements, quarrels, how Christians are known. The born-again Christians are not known by the Bible they carry always or the many fellowships they attend. They are known in the spirit world by the light that shines continuously like a very bright candle in the heart or a circle of light around the head or a wall of fire around them. When a Christian is walking along, we see angels walking along with them, one by the right, one by the left, and one behind. This makes it impossible for us to come near him or her. The only way we succeed is by making the Christian seen, thereby giving us a loophole to come in. When a Christian is driving a car and we want to harm him or her, we find that she or he is never alone in the car. There's always an angel by him or her. Oh, if the Christian only knows all that God has for him, he will not mingle with sin or live carelessly. The making of a backsliding Christians. As a chairman appointed by Lucifer, I would send these girls to live in churches and fellowships. These girls would be well dressed and after the preaching would come out for the altar call, pretend to have received Christ and would be prayed for. At the end of the fellowship or service, they would hang around waiting for the preacher, who naturally would be very happy for these new converts. The converts may even follow the preachers to his house. If the preacher does not have the spirit of discernment, she would lure him into the scene of fornication or adultery. This takes place the moment he admires her lustfully. She would make sure he continually in, in this scene until she finally quenches the fire of the Spirit of God in him, then leave him. Mission accomplished. At this juncture, I would like to give a testimony of a minister. In the evil spirit world, he is known as a man of God. When he went on his knees, there would be a confusion among us. We therefore sent these girls to him. This man would, would even feed them, but would refuse to be enticed. They did all they could, but never succeeded. As a result, these girls were killed for their failure. I then changed to a woman and went to him. And by words and, and actions, tried to entice him but he was adamant. This was too much for me, so I decided to kill him physically. One day, this minister went to Udekope Road Market Town. I watched him as he bent down to, to price some commodities. I wheeled an oncoming trailer loaded with 
drums of oil in the market where he was. The trailer struck the NPA height tension pole and fell right into the market, leaving many people dead. But this minister was able to escape. How he escaped was a miracle. Another day, I saw him traveling to Okpo town on foot. I again whirled an oncoming army lorry loaded with yams to kill him. The lorry went straight into the new cemetery road, killed many people, but this minister again escaped. After the second attempt, we gave up. He is still alive. Because of a single Christian, the devil may decide to destroy many souls, thinking he could kill him, but he always fails. This incident had happened to many Christians, unknown to them, but their God always delivers them. The trouble is, the devil does not give up. His thoughts are always, I may succeed, but he never does. As long as the Christian walks with God's love and remains in him and does not get entangled with the affairs of this life, the devil can never succeed. No matter how hard he tries, only the unbeliever is at his disposal. The operation of the Christians, this mostly happens in dreams. Uh, a Christian may see in her or his dreams the following. A dead relation visiting him or her. A masquerade pursuing him or her. Maids swimming in the river. Maids bringing food and asking him or her to eat. A single female having sexual intercourse or even a married one having sex with a man. This, if not dealt with, sometimes leads to barrenness. Or, a pregnant woman sees herself having sexual intercourse with a man. This, if not immediately dealt with, could lead to a miscarriage. If a Christian experiences the above in his hair or dreams, he or she should not put it aside by the wave of the hand, but on getting out of sleep, he or she should examine herself and confess any unknown, any known sin unto God. Bind all these demons and ask God to rescue whatever had been tempered with. This is a very important. The person should also seek the help and counsel of a mature, spirit-filled Christian, older in the faith, the devil's soul winning. When Jesus Christ was leaving this earth, he gave his disciples a command, Go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations. While some Christians are still waiting for a more suitable and convenient time to obey this command, the devil has also given this command to, to his agents. The difference is, the devil's agents are more serious in winning souls than the Christians. One of the areas of the devil's souls winning is the secondary schools, especially girls' schools. Some of our girls are sent into the schools as students. We supply them with all the latest and expensive underwear. This is a first priority because in girls' hotels, they like using underwear only. Our agent will never lack anything. Cosmetics, dresses, underwears, books, provisions and money. A particular bathing soap would be given to her to lend to any student who requests for a soap from her. A girl desiring to be like her would be attracted and would be befriend her. Gradually, our agent would introduce us to him. At this point, we would visit her physically and would start giving her gifts and meeting her needs. With this, she would join us willingly. She in turn would win another and so on. This is taken as a mission and it is carried out with a determination to succeed. One thing should be made clear. Satan does not force anyone. What he does is to attract and make you come to him willingly. That is why the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That is James 4 verse 7. Another area of soul winning for the devil is giving gifts. We would send our girls to stand on the road and usually they are very beautiful and attractively dressed. You will also find them in hotels and through these avenues. We get them men and women. Many people we see advertised in these papers are missing, got lost through giving gifts to girls they do not know. You should therefore be careful who you lift in your car.
Chapter 5, My Encounter with Jesus. In the month of February 1985, we had our normal meeting in the sea, after which I decided to travel to Port Okapot in River State to visit my late uncle's wife. I met a man called Anthony. He has a workshop at Naja Junction along Trans Amedi Road, Port Harcourt, River State. He sent for me, and since in our society we have a we have a, a law never to refuse calls, I decided to answer his call. I went to him in the afternoon on a Thursday of that week. He started by saying, God has given him a message for me. He brought out his Bible and started preaching. There were three other Christians seated, a male and two females. He continued his preaching for a long time, and I wasn't sure I heard all what he said. He asked me to kneel down for prayers. I obeyed and quickly knelt down. Immediately he started his prayers. I was knocked down by the Spirit of God and I fell flat. I struggled up and stood like an iron, and I destroyed the iron chairs inside workshop. I looked outside and saw three of our secret society members, a man and two girls. They came in human form and moved toward the door, but because of the power of God, they could not enter. I am sure the alarm in the sea alerted them of the trouble, and with the TV they knew where the problem was and had sent the powerless rescue team. This always happens when any member runs into trouble while the two Christians men pulled me down on my knees, the girls continued praying and binding the demons, but they were not specific. They asked me if I believed in Jesus Christ. I said nothing. They asked me to call the name of Jesus. I refused. They asked my, me my own name and I told them. They struggled for hours and released me to go. No spirit was removed from me, so I went out the same way as I came in. The church events. The following day, being Friday, I was invited by the same Anthony to attend their night vigil at the Assemblies of God Church. Silver Valley, Port Harcourt. I accepted the invitation because attending church services to court slumber and confusion was part of our assignment. The, the program started with choruses. We sang until one of the members raised a popular chorus by a powerful Christian band of the powerless, powerlessness of the other powers except Jesus' power. Then I started laughing. I laughed because when in the spirit I looked into their lives, almost three quarters of the people singing this chorus were living in sin. I knew that because of the sins in their lives, they were exposed and could be harmed seriously by these powers. It is important that Christians obey the word of God and not allow besitting sins to remain in their lives. In that service, we were four from the sea and were singing and clapping with them. Again, I want to stress here that when a service started, members should be advised to first confess their sins and then go into a period of real praise to God. This will make an agent of, of darkness present very uncomfortable and in fact escape for his or her life. In this particular service, we were very comfortable and even went in into operation. Many started sleeping, choruses were sang weekly, and things went zigzag. Brother Anthony had already told them about me, so at about 2 a.m., they called me out to pray for me. As soon as I came out to the front, they started pleading the blood of Jesus. I stopped them and said, It is not pleading the blood that is the solution. I am a deep secret society member. If you agree that you can deliver me, then will I kneel down? These words I spoke were not premed premediated. The blood of Jesus scares demons and protects the believer. 
but does not bind demons. Binding of demons only takes place when the Christian uses his authority and gives the command. They agreed and they knelt down. At that point, the sister led by the Spirit of God shouted and said, If you are not worthy, do not come near. I am sure many did not understand what she meant. It is dangerous for a Christian living in sin to cast out demons. Many withdrew, and a few came out to pray for me. As they started with, in Jesus' name, I heard a big bang inside me and fell on the floor. Immediately, the flying demon in me went into action. I started running with my chest. Anybody running with my, my chest, anybody possessed with this flying demon is always very wicked and dangerous. The brethren never saw what was happening spiritually. I was running because of the stronger power in the room. Two opposing forces went into action and the atmosphere changed. I suddenly stood up and became very violent, and etc. etc. A demon went out of me and possessed a boy in the midst, and he started fighting them, trying to rescue me. The brethren never wasted time with him, rather, they took him and others who were afraid to, to the church and vestry and locked them inside. This continued till 7 a.m. I was physically exult, exhausted and became quiet. So the brethren gathered around me again and started shouting, Name them, who are they? Etc. etc. I kept quiet. After waiting for a long time and I said nothing, they were deceived to believe that I was delivered. They prayed and were dismissed. I was so physically weak that I found it difficult to walk out of the church. But something happened, for as soon as I walked out of the church and crossed roads, I became very strong physically. Perhaps some of the demons that left came back. I became very angry and decided to take vengeance on the church. These people had insulted me, I said to myself. And for this insult, I was going to come back to Lagos and get more powers with others as wicked as myself and then come back to Port Accord to take vengeance on all the members of the Assembly of God, Silver Valley, and road to Lagos. On getting to my uncle's wife's house, I told them I was leaving for Lagos immediately. I refused to be persuaded to stay and I took a taxi to Mile 3 Motor Park where I took a taxi for Oniche. My intention was to stop on at Oniche, see a friend, then proceed to Lagos. At Mile 3, we took off and on going to Amagwe at the International Airport Junction, I heard a voice calling me by my native name. Nkem. I turned around to see if there was a known face in the taxi, but there was none. Who could this be? Only my late mother calls me by that name. All others, including the spirit world, knew me as Emmanuel. While I was still wondering, the voice came again. Nkem, are you going to betray me again? I did not recognize the voice, but the voice continued asking me, are you going to betray me again? Suddenly, I had a severe fever. The heat that came out of my body was so high that the other passengers felt it. One of them asked me, Mister, were, were you well at all before traveling? I told them I was well and that I never had even a headache before leaving Port Harcourt. At Uamakapa in Uere, I collapsed inside the taxi. The next thing I knew was that two men, tall and huge, came to take me, one on my left and the other on my right and they never spoke a word to me. They led me through a very rough road with bottles and metals. As we moved along, these bottles and metals gave cards and I started crying, but these men still did not say a word. We moved on and came out to, to an express road. It was here one of them spoke and said, you are a wanted man, and we continued. 
We moved on to a very large and long building that looked like a conference wall. As soon as we climbed the pavement, a voice from inside said, Take him in. They took me in and disappeared, leaving me alone. What I saw inside this wall is difficult to explain, but I will try to explain as much as I can. The wall was well decorated and so large and long that one finds it difficult to see the end of it. I walked to the middle and then was able to see the end. At the end was an altar. I saw a moon and stars surrounding the sun. Then I saw a throne and seated on it was a very handsome man with a garment shining like the sun. He said, Come. But because of his brightness I could not go. Whenever I tried to move a leg I would fall. I stood up and tried again and fell. Suddenly a moon came out of the throne where he was sitting and moved on the ceiling right up where I stood. Then two hands came out of the moon and held my head, shook me and my physical body pulled off like pulling off a dress. Then the real me stood, the hands folded it as if folding a cloth and dropped it at the corner. The moon then moved back to the throne and then he that sat on the throne on the throne it said again come the spiritual cleansing i walked to a point and he stepped out of the throne to me removed my legs one after the other and poured out what was inside them and fixed them back he did the same with my hands and put them back in fact all the places the queen of the coast kept powers i wondered in my mind who can this be and how did he know the spots these things were kept after this, he went back to his throne and asked me to come. As I started walking, certain objects started falling from my body. Scales fell from my eyes, etc., etc. But before I got to the altar, it stopped. Where are you going? He asked. I answered and said, I am going to Oniche to see a friend. He said, yes, but I will show you what you have in your mind. Up till this moment, I did not know who he was, but one thing was certain, and that was he, was he was more powerful than all the powers I had come across. He beckoned on a man and asked him to show me what I had conceived in my heart. This man took me to a room and opened something like a blackboard. In fact, if there was a way to escape, I could have escaped. For before me was written all that I had planned against Christians and my plan against the assemblies of God Church, Silver Valley. The man brought me back to the altar and left. He came out of the throne and took me by his hand and said he was going to show me certain things. On our way, he said, I do not want you to perish but to save you, and this is your last chance. If you do not repent and come and save me, you will die. I will show you the abode of the saved and the disobedient. When he said this, I then knew he was Jesus Christ, the divine revelations. We entered a room and he opened something like a curtain. I saw the whole world, the people and all the activities going on. I saw both Christians and unbelievers all doing one thing or the other. We went into a second room. We opened the curtain again. And what I saw was very sorry sight. People chained. He called these people the hypocrites. These people looked very sorrowful and he said, they will remain this way until the judgment day. We went into a third room. He opened a curtain and I saw many people rejoicing and wearing white garments. This time I asked him, who are these? He said, these are the redeemed awaiting their rewards. We went into a fourth room, and what I, what I saw was very frightening. Dear reader, it is difficult to describe. It looked like a whole city on fire. Hell is real and terrible. If you had been made to believe that heaven and hell are here on earth, and that man has no hereafter but total annihilation after death, you better be well advised here and now that there is a real hell and there is a real heaven. 
No wonder when Jesus Christ was on earth, he warned men about hell. I say it again, hell is real. I saw it and it was a terrible place. I asked him, what is it? His answer was, this is prepared for Satan and his angels and for the disobedient. He named them as recorded in Revelation 21 verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable and murderers, warmongers and sorcerers, idolaters and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We went into the fifth room when he opened a curtain. What I saw can only be described as glorious. It was as if we were looking at it from mountain top. I saw a new city. The city was so large and beautiful. The streets are made of gold. The buildings could not be compared with anything in this world. He said, This is the hope of the saints. Will you be there? Immediately I answered, Yes. After this we went back to the throne and he said, Go and testify what I have done for you. Again he took me to another room. And when he opened the curtain, I saw all that was going to encounter on my journey to Oniche and Logos, and how he would finally deliver me. After this, he said to me, Do not be afraid. Go, I will be with you. He led me out of the wall and vanished. I woke up on a bed and in another man's house. I shouted. So the man and his wife ran out from their room. They first peeped and then came in. Why am I here? I asked. The men then narrated how I collapsed in a taxi and how they carried me to Catholic Cathedral there in Uere. How they sent for a doctor who came and after examining me said my pulse was normal and that they should wait and see what would happen. The doctor gave them the assurance that I would revive. The man then took me in, in his car to his house and had been waiting. He also confessed he never knew why he believed the doctor and why he took responsibility of taking me to his house. They asked me my name and address which I gave them and after that I kept quiet and never told them my experience. I stayed calmly with this kind of family for two days and then the man and his wife drove me to the Uere motor park where I took a taxi to Uniche. All that the Lord showed me about my journey happened one after the other. I took another taxi to Lagos first thing the following morning. I obeyed and left Lagos for Port Harcourt the following morning. I often ask myself, why would the Lord save a man like me, a man so wicked and destructive, an agent of Satan? I found the answer in these three words, God is love. Indeed, God is love. Chapter 6 Temptation and Victory My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will tear them from my hand. That is John chapter 10, verse 17 and verse 28. After my conversion to Christ, the first thing that happened was that all the gifts I had received in the sea, the telescope, the television, the, the sheds, and the photos I had taken in these laboratories of the sea, exhibited in my appointment with the photo of the queen of the coast all this disappeared on returning to port harcourt i had a strong desire to bear a desire to what the lord had done for me but i was not allowed to do so in the church my late uncle's wife who is also a christian led me to one of the pastors but he asked him the following question did he bring the paper it was later that I understood that when speaking of paper, he was referring to the certificate of membership of the church. What did a certificate of membership of the church have to do with my witnessing to the power of Christ and what he had done for me? He had transported me out of the kingdom of darkness to bring me into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom I have redemption by his blood and the remission of my sins. I was sad because I knew that Satan did not allow young converts to testify around them, especially those who were previously deeply involved in these activities, and that he would do anything to prevent such testimonies.
I remembered that the Lord had clearly asked me to go and testify of what he had done for me, and there I had to face rejection. Perhaps it was not yet the moment, so I decided not to give my testimony to anyone and to wait. I made a business to trip to Togo with three other traders. I bought goods there for 160,000 naira and gave 70,000 naira of my own money and I borrowed the 90,000 naira I was missing from the traders in Abba. Among my purchases were lots of lace, a whole assortment of drugs, especially antibiotics, syringes and thermometers and etc etc. At the Nigerian border we were detained by customs. Later we were asked to pay a bribe. We refused and the goods were seized including those belonging to my three colleagues. A few months later, everything that belonged to my three colleagues were returned, ex except for my goods. I went back to see them later. I was asked to pay 40,000 naira. But as I checked my merchandise, I discovered that everything of value, the lace, the syringes, the drugs, had already been stolen. I gathered what was left and calculated that paying 40,000 naira at customs would only increase the loss. So I decided to give them all that was left. The merchants from whom I had borrowed the money pursued me. Some called the police. Others went to court and planned to take my life. The only solution was to close all my bank accounts and to use all the money I had to pay off my debts. By the grace of God, I was able to reimburse everyone except 1,000 naira which I owed my landlord in Lagos. I was completely ruined and even had to borrow the price of the bus ticket. I went to find the new Christians I knew then to see if they could help me to get on with my life. I was neither answered yes nor no. I was always asked to come back the next day until I got tired of doing so. I was very frustrated and I didn't know where to turn for advice or help. I didn't know the word of God with all the confusion that was in my heart. I read the Bible but did not understand it. I was still thinking about what to do when I received an agent phone call from my village. I rushed home to find that the small apartment building I was having had been destroyed by my uncle. He was present and threatened to kill me. It was a challenge for my old nature. I remembered that when I was a member of the secret society, he treated me and knelt in front of me, but he knew now that I was transformed. I didn't know how he had known since I had not been home since my conversion and how it was he who threatened me. I called on the Lord and said to him, so you have saved, saved me to leave me in frustration and to allow my enemies to rejoice over me. I cried and decided to, re to return to the secret society. At least, although I made this decision, I had two major fears within me. During my conversion, the Lord clearly told me, this is your last chance. If I return to the secret society, it could mean my death. Not only physical death, but also spiritual death. If I stayed with the Lord, I was threatened with death by my uncle. I was in great confusion and needed help. I ignored the word of God and did not know what the word was saying regarding the issue I mentioned. Dear reader, you must understand that if I was in such confusion, it was because I had not been followed as a young convert. Following up on a young convert is very important and Christians should take it seriously. If you know you can't follow your convents, please do not go out and bear your testimony. Jesus Christ underlined this three times when he asked Peter, Simon, son of, son of Jonah, do you love me more than this? Feed my lambs. Many converts become backslid for lack of proper follow-up. If you love Jesus, take care of his lambs. The flight against certain agents during this period, the agents of of the queen of the coast began to persecute me. I suffered a lot at their hands. I had nightmares. On May 1, 1985, 
a month after my conversion, it was almost 2 a.m. and everyone was sleeping in the house. I was awakened by these agents. They ordered me to leave the house. I obeyed. I went out and they followed me. It was like a dream, but it was all real. We went to the cemetery located near the Anglican Church of St. Paul beyond Abba Road in Port Harcourt. When they got there, they said to me, You have to come back with us. If you refuse, we will kill you or we will reduce you to misery. After telling me that, that they left me, I regained all my senses and wondered how I had gotten to the cemetery at this time of the night. I returned to the house. My uncle's wife asked me where I had been. I didn't say anything to her, but went back to bed and fell asleep again. Satan's agents decided to attack me during the afternoons. Sometimes they attacked me while I was walking along the road. Those around me saw me struggling against something invisible or running as if I was being chased. Only I could see them. They did this four times, then stopped. It was then the Queen of the Coast who replaced them. On the first day, she came by car and stopped next to our house. She was well dressed and, as always, very beautiful. Everyone who was there thought she was my girlfriend. As soon as she entered, I knew who she was. She came around noon when everything was calm around. She sat down and said to me, among other things, you can go to your church and believe whatever you want, but only I ask you not to reveal my existence. If you agree, I will give you everything you need in this life. I didn't know the scriptures, so I just listened to her and watched her speak. She begged me and tried to persuade me to come back to her. I answered neither yes nor no. She got up and got in her car and drove off. My uncle's wife spoke to her about twice without knowing who she was. I never told her who this lady was. During her last visit, she changed her method. This time she gave me a stern warning, saying that she had tried during her visits to persuade me to come back to her, but that I had been very stubborn and that this was her last visit. If I continued to refuse to come back, she would come back to see me in August and then she would either kill me or disfigure me, or even reduce me to misery. With these words, she left. I was afraid, so I went to church one day where I called a brother. I told him about my problems, and I observed in some church members, etc., etc. This brother gave me the address of the scripture union office and said, This is where you will find help. I point out that this was the last time I saw this brother. I have never seen him again anyway in Port Harcourt until this this day. I took the address and I went by bus the next day to 108 Bonnie Street where the CU office was located. I met the typist who gave me the quarterly schedule of activities of the CU Remomosi Bilgrims group. See you from Rimomosi because it was the one closest to my home. I went the following Sunday to the St. Michael's Public School in Rimomosi where the group met. But I arrived at 2 p.m., not knowing that the meeting was starting at 3 p.m. I met the prayer group and I joined them. That day after the meeting, I knew I was where I should be. God put a Christian woman in my path whom I considered to be my mother. She was keen to explain the word of God to me and advise me. The brothers and sisters were very interested in me and looked after me. I felt real love. The Holy Spirit began to give me an understanding of the word of God, and my faith grew. I began to really appreciate my Christian life. August came and went, but the Queen of the Coast did not show up. Contrary to her threats, Psalm 91, which speaks of the protection of God, had just been fulfilled in my life. Isaiah 54 verse 17 is also fulfilled for me. Any instrument of war made against you will be of no effect, and every tongue that arises against you, you will convict it of wickedness. This is the inheritance of the servants of the Lord. This is the righteousness that comes to them from me, oracle of the Lord. In September 1985, I received a message that my name had been selected 
for a job as a distributor at cement silver brand for silver brand in lagos and that i was expected on on the 9 27 1985 to start my work there i i left port harcourt on the 9 of on on the on the month of the 9th uh, 26 1985 and i arrived in lagos during the night the next morning i went to the administrative services only to hear from the head of the personnel that my post had been assigned to someone else he asked me to come back the next day to see the director general on my way back to my apartment i passed down an alley someone came from behind and attempted to suffocate me by keeping my nose and mouth shut I fought for my life. People passed by me, but no one came to help me. It was the Lord who intervened. As I struggled with my hands, I heard a woman's voice scream. She pushed me away and said, Who is that person behind you? She repeated this question a second time and disappeared. From the voice, I recognized it was a woman, but I couldn't see who it was. I was dizzy and stumbled back to my apartment. There again, my owner was waiting for me, very irritated, and said, Why did you run away with my money and my rent? I begged him to listen to me and tried to explain that I was out of work for the moment, but uh, that I will pay him the, his money as soon as I get it myself. He agreed and thought the problem was resolved. The next day, I returned to the office and I met the director general. He begged me to excuse him for assigning my position to someone else. He was also still speaking when a, a, a young man came in and said to me, Are you not Emmanuel? I replied in the affirmative. He said to me, Yes, we will finally, we finally got you. Have you not finished running? We went several times to Port Harcourt and we saw that you were all the time with this woman who is your spiritual mother. It is a stumbling block for us. Now, here you are in Lagos, and we have you. You will never be able to return to Port Harcourt. It was I who took your place. I challenged him and said, you can't do anything. The director general was surprised to see what was going on in his office. I excused myself and returned to my apartment. A few minutes later, I heard a knock on my door, and Nina entered. She asked me if I was going back to Port Harcourt. I told him yes. She begged me to come back with them and told me that the tax I had been specially trained for had still not been assigned to someone else. In the Yoruba language, I was a kutipori, trained to lead agents of demonic powers, trained to take care of the underwater control room from where we would follow everything that was happening in the world and we could receive and send warning signals and mobilize forces and etc etc trained to assist the queen of the coast which involved which involved not only participating in ceremonies and sacrifices and performing special missions on her behalf but also other things that were difficult to explain trained to to plant with the help of the powers of darkness other secret societies seemingly harmless but capable of attracting young people as well as greater number of people who attend churches she told me that if i accompanied her i would have a double promotion and many blessings she confessed that they were responsible for this seizure and theft of my goods and that it was also them who had suggested to my uncle to destroy my building and to threaten me with death if i refused to follow her they would do many other things to me and ensure that I did not prosper. They also decided to fight my spiritual mother. If we can have it, we will have you too, she she told me. In response, I began to preach the word to him. She stood up and said, they're cheating on you. Then she left. This was on the evening of uh, the month of the 9th on the 28th, 1985. Barely 15 minutes after his, his departure, I heard another knock on my door. This time there were four men there. They mentioned for me to follow them. I did, accompanied by them outside. We walked some distance 
And one of them said to me, Do you know us? I answered, No. He added, We were paid by your landlord to kill you. As he spoke, one of them brandished a pistol and another dagger. I felt helpless and knew they were going to kill me. But God, in a supernatural way, performed a miracle that surprised us all, them and me. The men holding the gun fired, but no sound came from the gun. The one holding the knife slapped me on the back, but the blade did not penetrate. It made a sound like wand hitting someone. They were as scared as I was. The Spirit of God came upon me, and I began to preach the word to them. Three of them ran away, but the fourth collapsed and started crying, begging me to pray for him. I didn't even know how to, pr to pray back then, but I said the simple words, Lord, please forgive, me, forgive him, forget and forgive him. Amen. He gave his life to Christ. I took him to a nearby Pentecostal assembly. I told the pastor what had happened gave the man to him and left. When I returned home, my landlord ran out, fell on his knees and said to me, begging, Please forgive me. I thought you had decided to flee to Port Harcourt because of the money you owed me, 1,000 naira. I, forgive, I forgave him and we finally agreed that I would repay my debt in monthly installment. That same night, the Lord woke me up around two in the morning i didn't know why i i had woken up so i walked into the living room and saw a large turtle facing me i immediately remembered the bible study we had in port a court on the power of the word i then said this words turtle since i was born since i was born turtles have lived in the bush or in the sea but when you entered my room while my hindu my windows and doors were closed you sinned and you must die. For that, as soon as I said that, she disappeared. I returned to my room and fell asleep, and woke up a second time, and heard some noise in the living room. I went there, and saw a horrible looking vulture standing in front of me. I repeated the same words. As soon as I said, you have sinned, you must die for that, he also disappeared. This is the great testimony and powerful testimony of the servant of the Lord that was delivered from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Please do note that this testimony still continues. You may get the full testimony in his book, which I will leave the link in the description box. Hallelujah. Glory be to the name of the Lord.